Welcome back to chapter 21 on the immune system. Um, in part two, we're going to go ahead and explore the adaptive uh, body defenses. Now, in part one, we discussed the fact that our immune system, in an effort to protect our body from foreign pathogens, has two defense systems. The first one is going to be the innate system, which is nonspecific. And in part one, we discussed that would be kind of like your first and your second line of defense, such as your skin, your mucous membranes, as well as a host of different white blood cells, like our natural killer cells, um, as well as proteins like our complement and interferons, and of course, the induction of fever, and inflammation. In part two, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the adaptive defense system, and this is going to be a very specific defensive system because it's going to entail the production of your T and your B cells that will only be um, introduced or be activated once they are exposed to specific antigens or foreign entities. The adaptive defense system is able to amplify your inflammatory response as well as work together with the complement proteins. But what we do see happening is that for your def adaptive defensive system to be at full capacity, it has to be primed. And a lot of people consider this a shortcoming because it's not ready from the beginning. It has to be primed based on initial exposure to a foreign antigen, and in response, it will produce a specific T cell and a specific B cell. This, of course, will take time, which often means that your adaptive defense system will have a delayed response. However, the good news about this system, the adaptive defense system, is the fact that even though it might be delayed about, um, when you're initially exposed to the antigen, it is able to generate a memory of that antigen so that if you ever become exposed to it again, you have a much more drastic slash amplified response. When you think of your adaptive system, I want you to think of the three R's. It is going to recognize, it is going to respond, and it's going to remember. And it's all about remembering that your adaptive system is going to be very specific. So it's based on what you expose yourself to for it to develop. It is going to be systemic, meaning that once activated, it can spread throughout the bloodstream and go ahead and attack all different parts of the body, depending on obviously where the inflammation or the pathogen is. And probably the most important thing is the fact that it's going to be able to remember it's going to be able to form a memory, and this is then how we're able to become immune to certain antigens because our body has recognized them before, it has fought them off before, and it knows how to attack in a very strong and systemic way so that your body will go ahead and take, obviously, care of the pathogen before you have any symptoms at all of being ill from it. Now, the adaptive defense system is going to rely on two cells that I keep mentioning, the B cells, which are going to be part of the humoral immunity, and the T cells, which are going to be part of the cellular immunity. So let's go ahead and explore these a little bit more, and let's talk about exactly what I mean when you see the term humoral versus cellular. All right, so humoral immunity is all about the B cells. And the B cells, which are produced by your lymphocytes, are going to be able to generate antibodies. And these antibodies will float around in the plasma of your blood looking for any type of foreign antigen. And when they find them, what they will do is they will bind to them. Antibodies cannot actively kill the pathogen they will mark them for destruction. And that's actually a very important thing because by marking them for destruction, we oftentimes immobilize them as well as make it easier for your other immune system cells, like your T cells, to come over to the site of injury. Humoral immunity, the name, indicates the fact that you have an extracellular target. Extracellular means outside of the cell. And this is, of course, due to the fact that the antibodies will tag the outside of the foreign cell in order for it to become immobilized and mask, marked for destruction. So humoral immunity means outside the cell, means extracellular, and that is then why the antibodies fit perfectly in this category. And remember, antibodies are produced by B cells. 
Cellular immunity is going to indicate that the target is internal. So we're now looking inside the actual cell. And that is where you're going to have your T cells. Your T cells are also um, a branch from a lymphocyte. And what happens with the T cells is that there are many different types. We're going to talk about their different variations. But either way, the T cells are able to directly kill the infected cell. So unlike the antibodies, they don't simply mark for destruction. They actually go about and actively kill the foreign entity. And what we see happening is that they will utilize different chemicals as well as proteins to enhance inflammatory response, as well as activate other white blood cells over to the injury. So they're able to amplify your immune system response. So your T cells are part of your cellular immunity because you have internal cellular targets. Now, for those of us keeping track, your lymphocytes, right? We've seen that term quite a bit. That is one of your white blood cells. And keep in mind that your lymphocytes are able to give you your B cells for the humoral immunity, your antibodies. They're able to give you your T cells for your cellular immunity, but they're also able to give you your natural killer cells. Your natural killer cells are part of your innate non-specific defense system. And we discussed the natural killer cells in part one of our chapter 21 lecture. Now, I've also said the term antigen quite a bit, so I want to make sure that we all understand what they are. We've discussed antigens before when we were talking, for instance, about our blood typing, the fact that our red blood cells have specific antigens, little receptors on their surface that allow us to label our blood type as A, B, A, B, and O, as well as if it's plus or negative for the RH. So an antigen is going to be a surface marker, a little receptor. And what's unique about our antigen is that we have what we like to call self-antigens. Self-antigens belong to us. And then any type of cell that is going to be infected or foreign, like a bacteria cell, a viral cell, a cancerous cell, those cells will have foreign antigens. A foreign antigen is important because it doesn't look like your self-antigen. It's different in appearance, and that's going to allow our immune system to be able to detect that cell as a pathogen and start to attack it. Um, in order for our immune system to be completely um, proficient, it not only needs to be able to recognize these foreign antigens and successfully attack them, it also needs to leave the self-antigens alone, because if your body starts attacking your self-antigens, that is then how you develop an autoimmune disease. Now, your antigen can be either what we call a complete antigen, meaning that the entire cell is a foreign cell, so like an entire bacteria cell, a viral infected cell, um, a cancer cell, but you can also have what we call haptins. And haptins are due to the fact that you have these really small molecules that by themselves cause your body no harm. But with some individuals, these haptins start interacting with the proteins that we naturally have in our body. And they create a substance or a complex that our immune system recognizes as foreign. So, for instance, um, poison ivy is a really good example. Poison ivy has an example of a small molecule on the plant, a little haptin, that interacts with our proteins and causes us to have an allergic reaction against the plant. Some people will, for instance, have allergies against certain cosmetics, um, even some detergents, and that's because the molecules within these, um, in the makeup and in the detergent, will start working together with proteins that we have in our body, creating a complex that's never been seen before. So a haptin can be a small molecule, or you could have a complete cell that's completely foreign, which is then considered a complete antigen. Also keep in mind that some of your cells can become um, foreign antigens that were initially considered self-antigen. And that can be done, for instance, due to a mutation, or if your immune system makes a mistake, in that case, what we were chit-chatting about before, about um, producing an autoimmune response. 
Here is a very simple illustration. Part of what we see happening that's so unique about the antigen is that it needs to have an antiogenic determinant site, meaning a specific site that sets it apart. We also like to call those epitopes. So all cells will have like these little antigens, will have these little receptors that will have a unique shape, and that's gonna be their epitope region. And that epitope region is what our immune system is looking for. If it's the one that looks like us, our self antigen, the immune system leaves it alone. However, if we see that it's foreign, then we can get things like antibodies to be secreted that fit specifically to that epitope section and will then bind and immobilize the foreign antigen from going anywhere further. Same thing goes for the T cells, with the exception that the T cells will actively kill, not just bind and immobilize, like we see with the B cells and their antibodies. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in addition to the T cells and the B cells, we have a third type of cell that's very important to our adaptive immune system. This third category are called antigen presenting cells, APCs. And what the antigen presenting cells do, it's all in their name, they have the ability to recognize a foreign antigen. They will partly start to attack and digest that antigen, but more importantly, they will take a little piece of that antigen and they will present it over to the B cells and the T cells, thereby allowing them to recognize the foreign entity and go over to the site of injury. Um, the antigen presenting cells make the rate of recognition faster because they're able to scavenge more area than the T cells and the B cells by themselves. And like I said, you can think of them kind of like a little assistant that whenever they see something that doesn't belong, they will go ahead and report back and present this foreign entity to the T cells and the B cells. Your three antigen presenting cells that you should definitely know are going to be your macrophages. So after they phagocytose, they will take a little piece of that foreign entity and bring it over to the T cells and the B cells. Your dendritic cells, which we see all over our epithelium cells or skin cells, they're excellent antigen presenting cells. And then believe it or not, your B cells are also considered antigen presenting cells because as they tag the foreign entity and immobilize it, they can also bring that over to the T cells to present it to them so that they can, amount, uh, they can mount their cellular response. So let's take a quick look at this, and this is going to come hopefully as a little bit of a review um, because I know we've already discussed our blood chapter, but this is just kind of like a little reminder of where your T cells and your B cells are actually coming from. So over here we see that we have our adaptive defense system, and as you can see, we have our humoral immunity for the B cells and our cellular immunity for our T cells. Now remember that all of your white blood cells are going to come from the origin site of the pluripotent stem cells, which we find in our red bone marrow. And in this case, the white blood cell that we're after is the production of the lymphocyte. The lymphocyte, as it's being produced, is eventually going to be secreted, and what we see is that some of them will go over to the T-thymus, and some of them will stay within the bone marrow for the next step. And the next step is going to be the fact that we're going to go ahead and make them immunocompetent. Immunocompetent means that these cells will learn to discriminate between self-antigen and foreign antigen. Okay. Now, the cells that become immunocompetent in the thymus are going to be our T cells. That's where the T comes from. The cells that become immunocompetent in the bone marrow are going to become our B cells. And remember, when we take a look at our previous chapter of our lymphatic system, our primary lymphatic organs are going to be our thymus and our bone marrow because that is where we activate our immunocompetence, our T cells and our B cells. Once the immunocompetency uh, training has completed itself and the cells now are able to figure out what belongs and what doesn't belong, we see that the T and the B cells will go over to our secondary lymphatic organs and they're going to do what we call seeding. Seeding basically means that they're going to find a place to stay within the second lymphatic organs and that's where they'll just hang out waiting for them to become activated. And activation means that they have a foreign antigen that's presented to them
And when they become activated, we then see that oftentimes there will be a proliferation and a differentiation step. Proliferation means that it's going to multiply the T cell and the B cell, so there are a lot more of them. And differentiation is now where the uniqueness comes in, that the T cells and the B cells will differentiate to attack that specific antigen that caused them to become active. Part of the activation process will be that you create your effector cells. So these are the cells that will actually have an effect. So these will be, for instance, your antibodies that will be able to tag um, the foreign antigen or your T cells that will be able to actually kill the foreign antigen. And you will also generate memory cells so that you can create a mark of that particular attack. So upon sequential encounters, you'll have a faster response to the time. All right, so one thing I definitely want to discuss with you is if your T cells become immunocompetent in the thymus, what exactly do they have to do or how do they get educated or trained to be able to recognize a foreign antigen and a self-antigen. Now, in our previous chapter for our lymphatic organs, we talked about the fact that your thymus has a blood barrier that basically shields off these immature T cells from the rest of the cells so it can have ample time to kind of train it and give it exposure. And within that blood barrier, that sequester region that the thymus makes, what we see happening is that your T cells have to go through two main processes. The first one is they have to do what we call a positive selection. And those that pass the positive selection then have to do a negative selection. So let's take a look what each of these entails. So please take a look at your illustration, and as you can see on top, it says the first step is a positive selection. And the whole goal of this is that we have to take our T cells, and it has to recognize what we call our MHC region, the histocompatibility complex. This is a specific region that all of our cells have, that is where your antigen is going to be housed. So if you look at the cells that have been drawn for you, you can see right here in purple, we have our thymus cell, our thymic cell that's presenting an antigen. This antigen belongs to us because the thymus is part of our body, right? So as you can see, it's been labeled as a self MHC with a self antigen. So this is a part that says, hey, this receptor is mine. It belongs to me. Now, in the positive selection, we see that we have a developing T cell. So it came right out of the bone marrow, went over to the thymus. And in positive selection, we need that T cell to recognize the self MHC complex. Okay? So we have two options. One is that it fails to recognize the self MHC. The second is that it recognizes the self MHC. And when it does so, we see that that is our goal. That means it's been successful. So those that are able to pass will move on to the negative selection. Those that fail, we need to get rid of those. So we're going to do apoptosis on the majority of them. Um, the reason we want to induce apoptosis cell death is because they could become harmful to our immune system if they're not able to discriminate between self and foreign antigen. So we don't want to have those cells around. Now, it might surprise you to learn that over 90% of developing T cells will fail the positive selection process, so a lot of them do not make it. However, nothing to worry about because what we see happening is that those that were able to recognize the MHC in positive selection, they will go ahead and be amplified or proliferated, so we'll make copies of them, before they move on to the second step, which is negative selection. In the negative selection, we see that the T cell must not recognize the self antigen. So before we were all about the MHC region, which is the housing capacity of the antigen. Now we're going to be about the antigen itself. So here in my illustration, it says my negative selection. The goal is that my T cell must not recognize my self antigen and by recognition it means that it's going to tightly bind to the self antigen so here we can see 
that it recognizes the self antigen, which is what we don't want it to do. So we're going to eliminate this T cell. We don't want that to cause any self reactive issue. So we're going to induce apoptosis again. And if we see that the T cell does not recognize, meaning you see this little gap right here? Meaning it's interacting with your MHC here in purple, but it's not interacting with the antigen, the little red line. So because it's not recognizing, not tightly binding, that means that it's successful in its negative selection process. And once it's able to pass the positive and the negative selection, then now we have what we like to call an immunocompetent T cell. A T cell that's able to interact with your MHC region, but that will not respond to your self antigen. Okay, so positive selection, you want them to interact and recognize the MHC, the major histocompatibility complex. And then part two, negative selection, you do not want them to recognize, aka bind, with your self antigen. So those two steps are needed for you to produce an immunocompetent T cell. So here's a quick little overview of the differences between T cells and B cells. Remember, both of them are examples of lymphocytes. So as you can see here on the B cell, the type of response is humoral, extracellular, and they will be able to produce antibodies. They originate from the bone marrow, and their site of maturation is B for bone marrow as well. And their plasma cells for the B lymphocytes are going to be the ones that have the effect because they'll be the ones that will actually um, produce or develop into our antibodies. And they form a memory. Now compare that to your lymphocytes right over here. We see that it's a cellular response because it's an intracellular target. They also come from the bone marrow, but they will mature in the thymus. That's where the T comes from. And then here we have some of the effector cells. We haven't discussed all of these yet. You have your cytotoxic T cell, you have your helper T cell, and you have your regulatory T cell. You also will have a memory T cell because you're able to form a memory of that particular attack. Here is just another look at our antigen presenting cells. Remember, these are the ones that are taking little pieces of the foreign antigen and presenting it over to our T cells and our B cells for recognition. And remember, they're going to be your dendritic cells, your macrophages, and your B cells as well. All right, now speaking of the B cells, let's take a quick look at them before we go into more detail about the T cells. So we'll visit the effector cells and the T cells. Don't worry, we'll talk about the killer T cells and the suppressor T cells and all that other good stuff. But let's just concentrate on the B cells for now. Now, the B cells we know are gonna be extracellular targets. They're part of the humoral immunity. Our B cells will eventually give us antibodies that will be able to bind to the antigen and when they bind to the antigen, its main goal is in addition to making the effector cells, which are the antibodies, to also produce the memory cells, which are gonna be important for any type of secondary exposure your body might come across. Your effector cells are gonna be also called your plasma cells because they will be the ones that will be able to secrete the antibody, as I mentioned to you before. So this little slide just gives you a little bit of information. So it says right here, um, you can produce a specific antibody at a rate of 2,000 molecules per second. Um, they usually stick around for four to five days and die off then, because by then the infection has obviously um, either um, decreased or it has stopped altogether. And then keep in mind that your antibodies are circulating within your plasma of the blood. We'll also find some in the lymphatic vessels, but mostly in the blood. And what they're looking for is going to be a foreign antigen so that they can mark it. They do not actually destroy it. They simply mark it, which usually allows them to become immobilized. So here's a quick look at our development of antibodies. So what we see happening here, once again, it falls in the humoral immunity system, is that we have a foreign antigen that will go ahead and bind with a specific B lymphocyte. 
Now remember, they get their name B because they have become immunocompetent in the bone marrow, so they're able to recognize self versus foreign antigen. And in this example, our little red antigens are all foreign antigen. Now, when your B cells become activated by the interaction between the foreign antigen and its receptor, we see that it's going to start proliferating. And when it's proliferating, it's going to do a few things. It's going to allow us to produce lots of copies of the plasma cells, and the plasma cells are the ones that are going to secrete our antibodies. So they're the ones that are going to specifically recognize these foreign antigens and tag them. But also, look what it does over here, all the way on the right-hand side, is that it will form memory cells. And the memory cells will keep track of this antigen and will recognize the particular antibody that was needed to tag them for destruction. And this goes literally in your library, in your immune system, where the memory B cell just stays for the rest of your life, waiting for your body to ever encounter a secondary or another exposure to the same exact foreign antigen. What happens when your body does just that? It comes across that antigen again. Well, let's click over to our next slide and take a look at what's happening over there. So here we have our memory B cell and it says, if you become exposed to it again, so this is a secondary response, and this can be a few weeks later, it can be a few years later, your memory B cells stay within your immune system. We see that the memory B cell will quickly become activated, and it will allow for a more amplified and a more rapid response. So it will go ahead and start its proliferation aspect, and as you can see, it will produce a high amount of plasma cells in a quick pattern, which means that we can go ahead and secrete antibodies in a much higher concentration than we initially did when we first became exposed to that foreign antigen. And yes, in case you were wondering, we will still make memory B cells so that we can once again keep track of this exposure to the foreign antigen. So take a look at this little chart right here, and it basically says if we're doing an antibody titer, which means we're taking a look at how much antibody you have floating around in your plasma, we often see that there will be a delay in antibody production based if it's a primary versus a secondary exposure to a particular antigen. So go ahead and take a look at the blue line. Now the blue line is going to represent antibody production for antigen A. And you can see right here on your graph, on day zero, that is the first time your body ever became exposed to this foreign antigen. It had never seen it before. Now, because it's a new exposure, what we see happening is that your body doesn't have antibodies that are already specifically primed for this antigen. It's going to take a few days for your body to go ahead and activate the B cells and for the B cells to proliferate, make their plasma cells so they can secrete antibody. So here on my graph, it says that the antibodies specific to A don't really show up until around day five. So from day zero to five, you have absolutely no specific protection, which means you're only relying on your innate defense system. So you're relying on fever, inflammation, interferons, your skin and your mucous membranes to fight it off. Once the antibodies do get primed and they start secreting, because remember they're proliferating, we see that their concentration starts to increase. So by now you have a very specific defense mounted against this antigen. So oftentimes you start feeling uh, better at a faster rate. And what we see happening is that over time, you can see that the antibody titer concentration will go down again because we've successfully fought off the infection. So you no longer need the antibodies. So those cells will go ahead and die off. And what will remain will be your memory cells. Now around day 28, it seems like our patient is going to become exposed to the same exact antigen that it initially was exposed to on day zero. But look what happens over here. The minute it gets exposed to antigen A for the second time, there is a quick increase. Look at this amplified response in antibody production. There is not a delay because your body has seen this foreign antigen before. It has the memory B cells. So it can go ahead and give a faster and a larger response to it. And by comparison, you can see that the patient also 
not only gets exposed to A, it also becomes exposed to antigen B. Antigen A in this case was a secondary exposure, so you have a quick response. Antigen B is also new, it's the first time, and look what happens. No response for antigen B until once again about five days later, because that's the time that your body's going to need to prime the B cells, proliferate it, and actually go ahead and make it specific for that particular antigen. This is one of the reasons why it's so important for our body, if we know that there's a certain disease out there, to sort of prime and do some of the work before. And this is the whole thought process behind vaccines. If there is a way for us to kind of artificially expose our body to a small amount of virus, we can go ahead and start priming the body so that along the way, we start building up a memory of this particular foreign antigen so that if we get a second exposure, we get an amplified response and oftentimes our symptoms will be severely reduced. Some of us might not even get sick if we get a viral load or a secondary exposure to it. So that's kind of like something to think about. And this also explains why if you've never been exposed to an antigen before or a foreign antigen, why you will get severely ill because your body's still trying to figure out what specific B cell, as well as a specific T cell, it can produce to go ahead and uh, fight off the infection. So speaking of your antibodies, it turns out that the way that your body can produce a full picture of the humoral immunity is either through what we like to call an active or a passive process. An active process means that we're encountering different antigens, so different foreign cells, as we go ahead and we just like expose it to our body, and our body in response has to produce the specific antibodies. So right over here it says active humoral immunity is when our body is exposed to the antigen, and in response we produce the specific antibody. There are two ways to do that. So there are two ways to do the active humoral immunity. The first one is what we call naturally acquired. So this is you just kind of like living your life. So when you go out, when you eat, when you travel, we're always exposed to different bacteria and viral infection, virus particles. They're all around us, okay? And as you expose your body to it, your body starts to learn all these different foreign antigens. So it can naturally start producing antibodies against it. This is one of the benefits of having little kids play in the dirt, as they say, right? So let the kid get dirty, let the kid get exposure to different things, because that's part of how they're going to start building up their immune system. Your body is naturally exposed to these antigens, and your body naturally starts producing antibodies. The other example is artificially acquired. Artificially acquired is where vaccines come in. So this is when on purpose, in an artificial matter, we expose the body to a foreign entity. So for instance, when you go to get the flu vaccine, that's an example of an artificially acquired active humoral immunity because you are artificially exposing your body to the viral particles that would make up the flu for that particular season. Why do you do that? Well, because you want your body to kind of get a little preview so it can prime itself so that if you become exposed to the same viral particles later on in the year at a higher dosage, your body doesn't have to wait five to six days for those antibodies to develop. You already have a memory of it and you can have a quick amplified response. This is also one of the reasons why in our current situation with uh, COVID-19, we are so eager to develop a vaccine because those of us who have not been exposed to the virus yet, haven't gotten ill from it, we want to start priming our body so that if we do become exposed, we don't suffer any of the severe symptoms that we see that the disease can produce. So naturally acquired means this is you just living your life doing your day-to-day -day activity, and artificially acquired is when you artificially expose yourself. So this is then where your vaccine would come in. So on purpose, you're exposing yourself. Either way, you're doing both of them in what we like to call an active humoral immunity role, meaning your goal is to encounter the antigen, the receptor, and then you allow your body to produce the antibodies by itself. 
There is also what we call passive humoral immunity. Passive humoral immunity is when we take antibodies that have already been made, so they're from a secondary source, and we introduce it into our body. So we don't allow our B cells to make the antibodies. We introduce the antibodies into the system. And because we introduce the antibodies, keep in mind that our B cells have not had time to make a memory of it. So usually passive humoral immunity is really only good for a couple of weeks. But it gives your body a little bit of a head start because we provide the body with antibodies that are specific to that antigen. So while those antibodies are fighting off or marking the antigen, it allows our B cells to produce their own antibodies and still have a defense mechanism while it's doing so. You can have naturally acquired passive humoral immunity. This is what we see when it's passed from mom to child. So when a baby is born, they are born literally with a blank slate for an immune system because they haven't been exposed to anything yet. So what we do is in order to protect the baby, we see that the mom will pass along some of her antibodies through the placenta as well as through the milk, primarily the colostrum, which is the first secretion. It's like a yellowish, thick secretion that mom will start lactating off first. It is chocked full of antibodies, so these antibodies will form a protective blanket for the immune system while the baby has time to start producing its own antibodies. Then you also have artificially acquired antibodies. This is when we give our patients uh, plasma or we give our patients antibodies. Or for instance, if a patient comes in with a snake bite, we can give them an anti-venom treatment. So this allows us to have these antibodies ready for use to go. Keep in mind that this protection usually only lasts about two to three weeks. But the good news is, is that in that time period, your body has a defense system while it waits for its own B cells to produce the specific antibodies. So once again, guys, and I'm sorry if I'm starting to sound like a broken record, active humoral immunity means that you become exposed to the antigen and you produce the antibody. Passive humoral immunity system means that you are given the antibody. And this is usually a short-term protect, uh, protection because it usually only lasts the lifespan of the antibody, which is about two to three weeks. Here is a nice little chart that kind of highlights everything again. So as part of our production of our antibodies, our humoral, we can either become exposed to the antigen, which is our active, or we are passed along the antibody, which is our passive. And as you can see in both categories, this can be done naturally or artificially. All right. Now, speaking of the antibodies, um, if you ever get a chance to take an immunology class, I would highly recommend it because these antibodies are fascinating proteins that really have a, such an important role in our immune system. I want to quickly kind of show you what an antibody is all about, and then I want to briefly discuss the five classes. Um, and once again, I'm really just kind of summarizing it. There's just so much more detail to go. But I want to make sure that you don't feel overwhelmed and you know what to study for your exam. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at our antibodies. They're also called immunoglobulins, abbreviated as IG. And as I said before, they are secreted by plasma cells and they'll float around in the plasma as well as the lymphatic system, mostly the plasma, looking for an antigen to bind to. Here is a general structure of an antibody. It is composed of two heavy chains and two light chains of proteins. And then on both sides, you see how it runs a little Y? On both sides, it will have what we call an antigen binding site that will be specific to the foreign entity that it's able to recognize and bind to. 
When it comes to the different class of our antibodies, um, I've placed little red stars next to their function um, because I'm going to try to limit the function of each type to maybe one or two entities. Um, so then that way you don't have to feel like you have to memorize everything. I don't want you to memorize anyways. But at least you know the most important ones. And the ones with the red stars are where I'm going to limit my questions for these particular um, antibody classes too. So for antibody M or IgM or antibody mu, as they like to call it, this is the one that's going to be secreted during a primary response. So please know that's the one you're going to do during a primary response. And I also want you to know that this is the one that you find in your blood plasma, meaning this is the one that's going to give us an interaction if you have a mismatch blood type. All right, so antibody M, mu is for a primary response and the one for a mismatch blood um, transfusion. Um, antibody A or alpha, that's going to be used for acute infections. And that's basically what you're going to study for your exam. And if you want to learn a little bit more, please look at the table and it will tell you things like you will find it in your saliva, your sweat, milk, lots of different body secretions. But for your exam purposes, please know that this is the one that's involved in short-term infections, acute infections. Antibody D is found on the surface of our B cells. Antibody G for gamma is the one, now this one has three stars, it's the one that's involved in chronic infections. It is the most abundant antibody that we have floating around our plasma. Now, the reason it's involved in chronic infections is because it plays a role in both secondary as well as late primary responses. So it has a prolonged effect, hence the use for it in chronic infection. And then the third thing is that antibody G, the gamma, that's the one that mom will pass along to her baby. So please know that that's the antibody that will cross the placenta and you'll be able to pass through milk secretion from mom to child. So it plays a role in the passive humoral immune system. Um, the last antibody is antibody E, and that one is going to be known for being able to release histamine, which means that it becomes very important in the role of our allergic reactions. So antibody E is going to trigger histamine secretion, which means it plays a role in our allergic reaction. And last but not least, for antibody E, we also see that in chronic parasitic infections, it will be an elevated titer. It will show, um, it will play a role in trying to go ahead and tag the parasitic infections as well. So allergic reactions, histamine, and parasitic infections. So those are, I said, it's like a really quick five-second overview of the antibody classes. Now, the last thing about antibodies is um, I want to talk about their actual mechanism of action. We already know that antibodies cannot directly kill. We talked about the fact that they will tag and immobilize. So let's take a look at their four main defense mechanisms. Those are going to be neutralization, agglutination, precipitation, and complement fixation. So these are the four methods, mechanisms of actions when it comes to the tagging of the antigen. So it doesn't actively kill. Remember that. It simply does either neutralization agglutination, precipitation, or complement fixation. Alrighty, so here's my little illustration. As you can see, my antigen has caused the production of a specific antibody, courtesy of my B cells that have proliferated and differentiated into my plasma cells. And now I can see that its mechanism of action can be neutralization. Neutralization means that the antibody will interact with the foreign antigen by its epitope region and it will mask the dangerous parts. So it will neutralize the foreign entity. So it tags it and it neutralizes it so it can't do any more harm to the body. The second part is agglutination. And agglutination literally means clumping. And that's due to the fact that the antibody will clump together with the foreign antigen. So here in my illustration, I see my little red blood cells here. And then you can see the little antibody. 
and we can see that it's interacting with the antigen binding region and it's clumping the cell and by doing so it's creating a larger entity it is immobilizing the foreign self so it also makes it easier for it to um, call over additional immune cells and of course because it's being clumped that foreign cell has a hard time spreading over the further parts of the body now, antibodies don't always have to interact with cells. They can also interact with small little particles. So if we see that happening, we don't call it agglutination. We call it precipitation. So notice on your illustration how your antibody is still in blue, the Y-shaped blues, and it's interacting with these little red circles. These are little particles, little soluble antigens. So they're not cells. But because they're still interacting with it and clumping together, we're going to call that precipitation. So both agglutination and precipitation involve clumping. The difference is agglutination is when you clump an entire cell. Precipitation is when you clump together a little particle um, or a little molecule. And then our fourth mechanism of action is when it interacts with the complement proteins that we mentioned in part one. And as I said to you before, the complement proteins have many different roles. The role that we're going to associate it with most is the fact that it will enhance our inflammatory reaction. Um, but I also definitely want to mention that it can work together with the antibodies. And as it's working together with the antibodies, it can go ahead and eventually lead to the actual lysing of the cell due to the fact of the formation of the little perforin channel right over here. All right, everybody, I am going to go ahead and come to an end. Um, in part three of our lecture, we're going to go ahead and go back to our T cells and take a look at the different effector cells, and we'll discuss how each of their roles is very important to the cellular immune system for our adaptive response. All right, we'll talk soon.